Good morning. I'm Asana Giordano, and this is your DMV Daily Dose for Friday, February 28th, 2020. It's currently cloudy and 30 degrees in Baltimore. Expect mostly clear skies starting in the afternoon. Today's high will be 42 degrees, and the low will be 30. Well, the news everyone was talking about yesterday, of course, was the sentencing of former Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh, who held elected office in Baltimore for two decades and was elevated by voters to lead the city as its mayor after the upheaval of 2015 and was sentenced to three years in federal prison yesterday for a fraud scheme involving a children's book series. The Baltimore Sun reports that U.S. District Court Judge Deborah Chasenow described Pugh's crimes as astounding and said that she took advantage of a career spent doing good works to mislead organizations who purchased her Healthy Holly books. Pew isn't being imprisoned immediately, however. Chalcinol said that Pew would have to report no later than mid-April. But Chalcinol also ordered Pew to pay restitution of $400,000 to the University of Maryland Medical Center and another $12,000 to the Maryland Auto Insurance Fund. She also said that Pew must forfeit nearly $670,000, including her Ashburton home, as well as $17,800 in her campaign account. Pew agreed that all of her copies of the Healthy Holly books would be collected by the FBI and destroyed. Now, Marilyn Matters was reporting that Maryland senators are weighing a bill that would direct an additional $2.5 million to the Office of the Attorney General to fight violent crime in the city of Baltimore but that Attorney General Brian Frost is not sold on the measure. In her interview with Marilyn Matters, Frost said Wednesday evening that he didn't think it was good neutral principle to enshrine in law a particular amount of money devoted to addressing crime in a particular jurisdiction. Quote, I don't think it's a good idea, Frost added, adding that his office is willing to help with crime fighting efforts as needed throughout the state. He went on to say that we're willing to do anything we can to fight crime in Baltimore, but he thinks that his office can add value to crime fighting efforts by continuing to focus on multi-defendant complex cases, which often spill over jurisdictional boundaries. But Senate President Emeritus Thomas Mike Miller, a Democrat from Calvary County, said he introduced the funding bill as a courtesy to Republican Governor Larry Hogan Jr., who began pressing in September of Uh, for 25 additional positions within the office of the attorney general to address state level criminal violations in the city of Baltimore, where 348 people were murdered just last year. Hogan funded the positions through his proposed 2021 budget. So Miller said Wednesday that introducing the measure as a bill would allow for a thorough debate of the issue. But Baltimore City State's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, testified in opposition to the bill calling it a waste of $2.6 million of taxpayer money in perpetuity to duplicate an office that already exists. Mosby has felt her office is under attack since Hogan's September announcement when he called into question decisions by the state's attorney's office to drop cases or reach plea agreements. Senator Miller said, though, he thinks additional prosecutors in the city can stem the number of homicides, similar to an expansion of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the state earlier in the decade. We can do it again, and if we provide resources, people coming together, staying together, and working together, that this bill will work, said Miller. Miller's bill also received a letter of support from Governor Hogan on Wednesday. The administration noted that Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office is one of only two local prosecutors' office that receive dedicated funding from the state, and that Frosch's office will be well-suited to tackle complex, violent crime cases that may involve multiple defendants across jurisdictional lines. Quote, the $2.5 million in funding for the Attorney General's office will only serve to strengthen prosecutions and is yet another tool we can utilize to address this public safety crisis. The governor office wrote. Well, Maryland Matters is also reporting that one year after a major controversial piece of legislation to create a private police force at Johns Hopkins University was pushed through the General Assembly, a late file measure in the House of Delegates 
would now expand the potential powers this year of the police at a Baltimore-based university. Members of the Morgan State University Police Force would have the authority, under this legislation, to use their official powers off campus at the request of the mayor of Baltimore or the police commissioner under the proposal sponsored by nine state lawmakers who represent Baltimore City. House Bill 1640, sponsored by Delegate Kurt Anderson in the 43rd Legislative District, would create an additional exception to existing law, which limits university police officers' authority to the school's campus. Currently, Morgan State officers may only police on property that is owned or leased by the school unless officers are in pursuit of a suspected offender or they're authorized by the governor. HB 1640 would grant officers the ability to exercise police power off campus if requested or authorized to do so by the mayor or the commissioner. It's another crime fighting measure that I can support, said Delegate Talmadge Branch, a Democrat from the Baltimore City 45th District and one of the bill's co-sponsors. I'm all for doing anything to make Baltimore safer, Branch says. Larry Jones, a Morgan State University vice president, said the legislation would extend campus protections to the increasing number of students who live off campus. Jones said that the legislation would put the authority of Morgan's campus police in line with what's permitted in the vicinity of other university system Maryland campuses. Quote, having the jurisdiction to police the areas where Morgan students live off campus and with the support of our neighboring community associations, the university will be able to provide greater protection and enhance safety for those traveling to and from the campus, Jones said. In 2019, state lawmakers granted a request from Johns Hopkins University to create a police forum with armed officers. The measure was highly controversial as critics expressed fears of armed officers patrolling on and around school campuses to protect students and staff, but not the surrounding community. The city's legislative delegation was divided on the measure, but legislative leaders largely supported it. Now, lawmakers added a requirement that the privately run school police force create an accountability board to give nearby residents a voice in how department policies are developed and implemented. And speaking with Johns Hopkins University students just yesterday as a part of my periodical speeches on politics and media, the JHU legislation was actually brought up. And ironically, not a single student in that room felt unsafe on campus and not one of them supported the police bill that was passed last year. Well, DMV Daily News is reporting that next week, before members of the House Ways and Means Committee get ready to hear testimony in regards to HB 1628, which is a sales tax on services bill, members of a diverse coalition of Maryland business owners will convene a drive-in press conference opposing what they say is the largest tax increase in state history. The joint press conference organized by the Coalition of Maryland Business Organizations, which includes some heavy hitters including the Maryland Chamber of Commerce, the State Bar Association, AAA, Maryland Retailers Association, and many more, will be held two hours prior to what appears to be one of the most contentious bill history hearings of the legislative session. As Maryland Democrats look for ways to pay for the proposed Kerwin Commission recommendations, that according to analysts will cause legislators to come up with upwards of $3.8 billion over the next 10 years, legislators have been considering various funding bills to pay for this educational improvement bill. But legislators wary of creating funding mandates without an identified funding source are trying to create innovative ways to fund the proposed increases in this year's legislative session, one of which is the possibility of passing this bill, HB 1628 which would lower the sales tax from 6% to 5%, but it would expand that tax onto everyday services that has never been taxed previously, including legal and accounting services, realtor, auto, and home improvement services, gym memberships, and so much more. This proposed massive tax increase would generate roughly $2.6 billion, says most analysts, and would be the single largest tax increase in Maryland history. Now, you might want to find out when this press conference and bill hearing happens next week by going over to dmvdaily.news. Well, I'm your man, Mr. Politics, and this has been your DMV Daily Dose for Friday, February 28th, 2020. For more information on the articles that I've mentioned, just go on over to that website at www.dmvdaily.news.